Okay, here we are with 8.2 inverse trig functions continued. So before we were using the unit circle and then we were um, using the calculator as well. So in this section, there will be some more of that. They're going to extend everything to secant, cosecant, and cotangent. Um, but we'll also be looking at triangles instead of just the calculator and just the unit circle. So we'll still be able to find exact values even if um, the calculator is not able to give us those exact values. So let's go ahead and continue. So just like cosine, um, the domain of secant or the range of secant is going to be zero to pi. Um, domain is from negative one to one or when the absolute value of x, actually it's not negative one to one, it's outside that. So it's everything that is less than negative one and everything that is greater than or equal to one, okay? So it's basically negative infinity to one and then, or negative one, and then positive one to infinity. That's the domain of the secant. Cosecant is the same and the domain of cotangent inverse is going to be negative infinity to infinity. So let's go ahead and work on the first example. So we know that um, if we were to take cotangent inverse of this, that means the cotangent of some angle equals square root of three over three. We can use the unit circle to do that, but then we'd have to manipulate that into its um, unrationalized version and then multiply the numerator and the denominator by one half. And so then we get this and then we can figure out where that happens. Now remember that cotangent is x over y, right? So here we have, um, remember tangent is from negative pi over two to pi over two. So um, you can convert that cotangent into, you don't have to convert it, we can leave it alone. So this means that um, it would be, x would have to be positive and y would have to be positive so that's going to put me in quadrant one and in quadrant one this is going to happen up here which is pi over three now let's verify if that is in fact the case now in the calculator you cannot plug in cotangent inverse notice that there's no button for secant inverse or cotangent inverse at all okay what you're going to have to remember is, um, and they don't really talk about this in this section, and I'm surprised that they don't, but there is um, the fact that these guys are reciprocals of one another. So I can show you the long way of what I'm doing, and then I'll show you the short way of what I'm doing. So if, for instance, you take this particular problem, sorry about that. Um, Okay, so if I take this expression here, so let me grab another piece of paper real quick just to show you. If I take cotangent of theta equal to one half over square root of three over two, because that was my manipulated version, right? Now cotangent is one over tangent. And then if I cross multiply here, this will turn into um, one half tangent theta equal to square root of three over two. And then if I divide both sides by square root of three over two, or I'm sorry, by one half, I get square root of three over two and one half. And so then if I continue and solve for theta again, I get that this is the tan inverse of square root of three over two over one half. Now compare what it was before I started and what it was after I start, I finished, okay, right? This was theta equals cotangent inverse of one half square root of three over two, okay? So this turned into this, right? And then that turned into this equation, that turned into that equation, that turned into that equation, and then this turned into this equation. What's going on here? 
Now, tangent and cotangent are reciprocals of each other. So if I take the reciprocal of cotangent, I get tangent. But if I take the reciprocal of this inverse function, I also have to take the reciprocal of the argument. So I took the reciprocal of that as well. I just flipped the fraction over, okay? So you can do this in your calculator using the tan inverse button, but you have to remember that it's going to be the reciprocal of that. So the cotangent of this is the same thing as saying the tan inverse of three over the square root of three. You don't have to rationalize it or do anything like that because your calculator will do that for you. So you can do second tan inverse of three over the square root of three, and then just close the parentheses, divide by pi, convert it to a fraction, and it does give you pi over three just the same, okay? So I just wanna make a little like box, like I know how they always put everything in little boxes, right? So I wanna make a box for these two. So if you're gonna do cosecant inverse, um, of something, right? You're basically going to be taking the sine inverse of the reciprocal of that value. The same thing if I wanna do the secant inverse of some fraction, then I will be doing the cosine inverse of the reciprocal, and then the same for cotangent inverse of a fraction. I will be using the tan inverse button, but of the reciprocal of that fraction. So that's really, really gonna come in handy when you're trying to use the calculator, okay? There will be times where we can't use the calculator because it's gonna ask me for an exact value and I just won't have that um, unless I use uh, the unit circle or the triangles, okay? The calculator is basically doing the unit circle for me. So if it revolves a unit circle, the calculator will be able to do it for me. It's only when they ask me for exact answers and it's not a value on a unit circle. It's like a value with some other kind of radius, okay? Not the radius one. And then in that case, we're, we'll have to do triangles. So this is just going over the same kind of thing. Remember that that is going to have a value between zero and pi. This one's gonna have one between negative pi over two and two because it's sine. And then the range of cotangent is also going to have one um, the same as tan inverse. Actually, tan inverse is not this domain, is it? It is negative pi over two and pi over two. So just keep that in mind when you're doing um, those problems. Okay, so here we go for our first exploration. So it tells us find the exact value. Oh no, he says use calculator. So they want approximate, and so we round it to two decimal places. So we're gonna do secant of five over one. That's the whole number, right? Oh, I'm sorry, can't see me. Push this down. So secant of five is the same as secant of five over one, which means I can do cosine inverse of one fifth. So I'm gonna do in my calculator, cosine inverse of one fifth, close it, and I get 1.37 rate to two decimal places. Then secant inverse of 0 0.8, I can do cosine inverse of one over 0 0.8, you don't have to convert this to four fifths and then flip over the four fifths. You can type it in there like that. The calculator would do all of that fraction manipulation for you. So this one says um, error, right? Um, and that has to do with the fact that if I clear this out, one over 0.8, is actually 1.25. And we know that this in here has to be less than one, right? When we're talking about cosine. So that's why this one is just not defined. And that's okay, it just isn't. Now for here, cotangent. So let's do the tangent inverse of the reciprocal. The sign does not change when you do the reciprocal. So if it was negative, it needs to stay negative. All you're doing is flipping the, the fraction over. So tan inverse of negative three over two, um, we get this and we're gonna round it to two decimal places, so 0 
negative 0 0.98. So that's how you do them in the calculator. So it is possible, but you do have to, to fix those before you can put them in the calculator. You cannot just type them in the calculator just like that. Okay, so um, let's look at exploration number two. So now is where we're getting into like the triangles because they want the exact value, but they give you these kind of values and those are not values that we're used to seeing from the unit circle, okay? So you can use a triangle. Now, in order for us to use a triangle, we do have to know what's quad what quadrant the angle will be in. So that's why in the previous section, they kept saying for you to look at the domain and then for you to decide whether this number was going to be in quadrant one or whether it was going to be in quadrant two. Because you need to know that. If you don't know that, you're going to draw the wrong triangle and then, of course, end up with the wrong answers, right? So we have to be able to look at this, figure out what quadrant it's going to be in, and then draw our triangle in that particular quadrant, okay? So for tangent, we know that we're talking about this tangent's um, domain is from zero, I'm sorry, negative pi over two to pi over two. So we're talking about these two quadrants over here. Now, if the tangent is positive, then we're talking about quadrant one. And if the tangent is negative, we're talking about quadrant two, okay? That's essentially what it boils down to, okay? Um, so what that means is since I have three fourths, it means that I'm positive, so I'm in quadrant one, which is why um, I chose quadrant one here, right? The y value is positive, the x value is positive. How do I know? because we know that tangent of an angle is going to be the y value over the x value, right? So technically what this is saying then is it's saying that y is equal to the three and the x is equal to the four, okay? Now, if this were negative, who exactly would be negative? If, if, it's ne if tangent were negative, that would mean I'm in quadrant two. Who's negative in quadrant two? The y values are negative in quadrant two. So that would mean that this would be negative three and the four would be a positive x value, okay? So it does have to match the quadrants that you're in, the, the x and y values of that particular quadrant. So here they read your quadrant one and they're saying, okay, your x value is a positive three, your y value, oh, I got that wrong. Your x value, y value is a positive three, an x value is a positive four. And so if I wanna figure out the radius, the radius would be the square root of four squared plus three squared, which is 16 plus nine, which is a square root of 25. So the radius is five in this case. Nice radius, great, fantastic, right? Now, so I know where the angle is. So remember, this is nothing more than an angle. So what I'm trying to find is cosine of that angle. I don't need to know the exact value of that angle. All I need to know is how to find the cosine of it, okay? So if I wanna take the cosine of it, I'm gonna take the x value over the r. That's how cosine is defined on a triangle where the radius is not one. So I'm going to take the x value over that radius. And so then this entire value comes out to just be positive four fifths. Um, I am trying to see if the calculator will give me the answer, and it does. So the calculator does give me the correct answer. I typed in cosine tan inverse of three-fourths, and I got 0.8, which is four-fifths. So that's great, right? This is fantastic. Here's where the problem comes in. What if I figured out what they gave me? But when I did the Pythagorean theorem, this was not a perfect square. Maybe this was the square root of something else, right? Not a perfect square. If I type that in my calculator, it's going to give me this crazy decimal. And how on earth am I supposed to know what that radical is, right? You wouldn't know what square root of what you're dividing by. It's not like the unit circle where I do the answer in the calculator 
and then I just divide by pi, and then I know how many multiples of pi I have. This is gonna give me a weird square root, and I wouldn't know what that square root is, so how would I know how many, what multiple of that square root I'm gonna get, right? It's, that's a little bit more complicated, so it is important to know how to do these um, triangles here. So we might have an example of that specific kind of thing, this next problem. So here we have example three. Again, it wants exact values. This might be what I'm talking about. So 10 sine inverse of negative two fifths. I get this. <laughs> I don't know what that is. That's not going to get to be put into a fraction. I tried to put it in a fraction. It's not. There's obviously some kind of weird square root in here that this is a multiple of, but I wouldn't know what that square root is just by looking at this problem, okay? So what we have to do is we have to go to the triangles. Now remember, you're talking about sine. sine. The angle for sine is going to live between negative pi over two and pi over two. If the sine is positive, it's in quadrant one. If the sine is negative, the y value, is negative, it's going to be in quadrant two. I have a negative, which means my angle is going to be in quadrant two. So there's my angle, and I made a triangle. Okay. Now, remember what this is saying it's saying that sine of some theta is going to equal negative two over fifth. So, and we know that that is y over r. We also know that r is always going to be positive. So that leaves me no choice but to use a negative two for y. And it makes sense. Isn't the y value going to be a negative in this quadrant, right? So um, that's what we have so far. So I know that this value is going to be negative two. I know that this is going to be five. What I want to know is the x value up here, OK? Now, in order for me to find that x value, I have to use the Pythagorean theorem. So I'm going to take the hypotenuse squared minus um, the leg squared. So I get the square root of 25 minus 4, which is the square root of 21. And that is not a perfect square. I don't even think that reduces. So nope, it just stays square root of 21. So this value is square root of 21. It's probably the number I needed to divide by in order to figure out my answer. But how would I have known that, right? So without doing all of this, so now I need to find the tangent of that angle. Well, remember tangent is y over x. So I need to take that y value, negative two, and divide by the x value, which is square root of 21. Now you can rationalize by yourself or you can rationalize using the calculator. Either way, you need to get the complete rationalized exact answer. So if I'm going from here, negative 2 over the square root of 21, it will rationalize it for me. If I wanted to prove to you that the calculator did know the answer, it just couldn't give me the exact answer. Oh my goodness, somebody is messaging, messaging me a lot. Okay, so that is the exact, that is the answer. It's just a, an approximation. Now, if I were to take that answer and divide it by the square root of 21 and then convert that into a fraction, chances are I'm going to end up with the multiple of negative 2 over 21. Let's hit enter. And sure enough, we end up with negative 2 over 21 times square root of 21. That is what is equivalent to this value right here. I wouldn't have known that. I would have had to have gone through all of this this to know to divide by square root of 21, right? So um, it's very important that you are able to take this information and build your triangle and then come up with the values like that. Um, you can do the same thing for the unit circle problems. It's okay. Um, it's not a big, a big deal. Now, Here's the last concept that they have. They don't have any examples other than this one that they've already worked out for you. Um, but I kind of wanted to show it to you in a different way so that you can help make sense of it. So this is the problem that I want us to do. Cosine of tan inverse of u. And so the first thing they want you to know is that this is u over one, right? And if I rewrite that, I can say the tangent of some angle is going to equal u over one, okay? 
then um, you could take that value and you could um, start to try to manipulate and do all this weird stuff. I really don't like this explanation. I say to hell with all of that and to do it using the triangles. I always like to connect things to what you've already learned, okay? I don't want to throw in identities and all this other weird stuff. Um, so what we need to do is we need to be able to use our triangle. So we know this, this I'm good with. We're saying we're going to put u over one. We're saying that we've got that. And then we need to remember that tan of theta equal to u over one is the same as saying y over x. So we are in this interval, right? And we're just going to assume we're in quadrant one. Just assume you're in quadrant one. If it comes out any different, that's because u was negative or u is positive. But I don't know what u is. So I'm not going to try to worry about that. So I'm going to assume I'm in quadrant one, and then I'm going to use that value. So this y and this x. So this x value is one, this y value is u. If I use the Pythagorean theorem, I get the square root of one leg squared plus another leg squared, right? And then if I want to find the cosine of this angle, then all I'm doing is x over r. So the x value, which is one, and then the r, which is that weird square root of u squared plus one. Now, if you just switch these two around, you get one plus u squared, which is exactly the same thing that they got using all this manipulation of um, trig functions, okay? So I much rather you do this process just because it connects it to something that you've already done, okay? So when I do these examples for this problem, and there are quite a few, um, I am going to be using the triangle to do these problems, okay? So let's go ahead and get started with some of the problems from the homework, because that's all I have there for the worksheet. So for 8.2, um, we're going to start with number three. So the problem says to do the cosecant inverse of 2 square root of 3 over 3. We know we can do that in the calculator. We just need to change it to sine inverse of the reciprocal. So 3 over 2 square root of 3. And then let's see what we get. So sine inverse of 3 over 2 square root of 3 and then divide by pi and convert that to a fraction so it is pi over 3 and that's all we needed to do for that one and then for number four it does ask me for the exact value and it's giving me this if you see square root of threes and square root of twos, um, they are talking about the unit circle, okay? If you see one and one half and two, things like that, you know they're talking about the unit circle. So I know that I can do this in the calculator. I mean, I could very well do it in the um, unit circle, but the calculator is always the faster way to go. Um, now, if you're doing it on the test in the calculator, at least show me what you're putting in the calculator, because I know you're not typing this in the calculator and getting the answer, right? You have to change it. So make sure you're at least telling me what you're typing in the calculator, and then tell me the answer. So this is divide by pi, convert it to a fraction. It's actually negative pi over 3. So those are the answers for those two types of problems. Now let's take a look at number five. We have cosecant inverse of negative two over square root of three. So again, negative square, square root of threes and twos, that's gonna tell me. So that's actually sine inverse of square root of three over two, but it's still negative. So sine inverse of negative square root of three over two, divide by pi, convert it to a fraction, I get negative pi over three. So then now let's look at example six. So example six wants an approximate, approximate, approximation, okay? So if they want an approximation, just put that over one and then change it to sine inverse of one fifth and then we can probably give them the decimal. So sine inverse of one fifth. 
Um, that is about 2.0 or 0 0.20. Okay, so this one did want an approximation. Now, number seven wants an exact value. So cosine, sine inverse of negative square root of three over two. Again, this can be done in the calculator. So cosine, sine inverse of negative square root of three over two. The calculator tells me it's just one half. How do I know it can be done in the calculator? Because you've got those square root of threes and square root of twos. That tells me it's unit circle stuff. If you do it in a calculator and you don't get an exact answer and you divide by pi and it's still not good, um, then you know you have to use the triangles. So let's see, number eight is tan of cosine inverse of negative square root of three over two. Again, square root of threes over twos. So tan cosine inverse negative square root of three over two, close, close. I get negative square root of three over three. So number nine is secant of cosine inverse of one half. Okay, so this one you have to be careful. You cannot do secant in your calculator. Okay, what you can do is one over cosine cosine inverse of one half, okay? That's what the definition of secant is, right? The secant of an angle is the same as one over the cosine of that angle. This is the weird, crazy looking angle. So I can type this in my calculator, one over cosine, cosine inverse of one half, close, close, and it tells me that it's two, okay? So you can do these in the calculator, you just have to be very, very careful. So number 10 is cosecant of 10 inverse of square root of three. Same thing for this one. I cannot put cosecant in my calculator, but I can put one over sine of this crazy looking angle. And so we're gonna do one over sine of 10 inverse of square root of three and then close, close. And we get two square root of three over three. Let's keep going. Number 11, we have cosine inverse sine of seven pi over four. A normal unit circle stuff. So we can do this in the calculator. Cosine inverse of sine of seven pi over four, close, close. We get, um, it should be pi's, so let's see, divide by pi and convert over, it is pi's, three pi over four. Remember, it's unit circle stuff, so should be able to do it. So pi or number 12, we have sine inverse of cosine, of negative five pi over four. That's on the unit circle, so I should be able to do this in the calculator. So it's sine inverse of cosine of negative five pi over four, close, close, um, divide by pi and convert it to a fraction. I get negative pi over four. So, so far, so good. Here's where it starts to get interesting. So finally, number 13. I have 10 inver or 10 of sine inverse of eight over nine. These are not values on the unit circle. And if you go and try to do this in your calculator, 10 sine inverse eight over nine, close, close. You get this weird decimal. And if you try to divide by pi and convert it to a fraction, it's not nice. That means that this is not the type of problem that you can do in the calculator. It just isn't, okay? 
So because you cannot do this in the calculator, we have to talk about the, um, oh gosh, the triangles, okay? So we're gonna take this, we know it's some weird angle, right? And so we know that that angle equals sine inverse of eight over nine. This is the same thing as saying the sine of that angle equals eight over nine. We also know that's the same thing as saying y over r. We also know that sine lives over here, right? And the y value is positive, so it has to be up there somewhere. So there's my y value. I know my radius is nine. I don't know what the x value is. The x value is going to be the square root of the radius squared minus the leg squared. So the square root of 81 minus 64, which gives me the square root of 17. So this measurement is the square root of 17. So that funky number I got in the calculator is obviously a multiple of square root of 17. Now I could stop here and go back to the calculator and keep finishing, but why? It's so much easier just to do this. So then tangent of this angle is gonna be y over x. So that's y over x. And then you can rationalize it and I get eight squared is 17 over 17. So if I go back to my calculator, go back to where I tried to plug that in. And if I take that and I divide by the square root of 17 and then convert it to a fraction, notice what it gives me, eight over 17 as the multiple next to the square root of 17. Okay, so you really, really need to use a triangle. If, if all else, at least just to figure out what that number is, to figure out what fraction goes in front of that radical, okay? So number 14 is going to be, and this you have to show me, right? If you're doing this on the test, I need to see where that square root of 17 came from. Don't just tell me this equals eight square root of 17 over 17. You need to show me where that square root of 17 came from, okay? So for number 14, I have this one. And this is the ones that had the U's, okay? And so these, we definitely need to use those triangles. So I'm going to use a triangle. Um, remember, this is just an angle. So I'm wanting to find secant of that angle. But that angle, that angle is sine inverse of U or sine of that angle equals u, which you can write it as u over one. We know that, you, that sine is y over r. So if I go here, the y value is going to be u, the r is going to be one, and how do I figure this out? It's the radius squared minus the leg squared. One squared is one, right? And then I wanna find the secant of that angle. So remember what secant is. Secant is um, r over x. So I would take one over the square root of one minus u squared. And I did type this in the computer and it did accept that as the answer. So that is it, I am done with this problem. But I did need to use my triangles to figure it out. For number 15, um, I had a problem like cotangent sine inverse of u. Um, so again, this is the same as saying cotangent of that angle. Now, I already drew the sine inverse situation. Um, if you want, we can change it just to make it a little bit different so we could see how that switches it up, right? Let's say it said cosine, okay? Then that means theta is cosine inverse of u, which means cosine of theta equals u over one. This is x over r. So now we're talking about the x value being positive. Um, so we're over here. Here's my triangle. My r is one, my x value is u. So this thing is the radius minus u squared. Remember one squared is one, so I don't have to put the square. And then if I wanna know the cotangent, that is going to be x over y which means I'm going to end up with u over the square root of one minus u squared, okay? Now the, the computer will take this, but I will mention, 
I had another problem. Just, I just want to mention this because I think it's worth mentioning. Um, I had a problem. The problem was originally this. Okay. And when I did all of the triangle stuff, I figured out that I got this as the answer. Okay. When I typed that in the calculator, for some reason, I do not know why, but for some reason, it did not like this as the answer, okay? So what I did was I manipulated it, and then the computer accepted it. So I just want to show you, because I don't want you to get into the same confusion as I did. So if you get an expression like this, whether it be a minus or a plus inside here, doesn't matter. If you get the square root on top, the square root of a binomial on top and the U downstairs, they're going to want you to do this. So the square root of U squared is U, right? U is the same as the square root of U squared. And then when you have a radical on top of a radical, you can write it as one giant radical with both of those fractions inside, both the numerator and the denominator inside, okay? Then what you can do is you can split the fraction and say u squared over u squared minus 1 over u squared, and then this simplifies to a giant 1, and this simplifies to 1 over u squared. This is what the computer wanted. Okay, you would not have gotten to that answer without manipulating what you get from the triangle. So this is what I got from the triangle. And MLP did not accept it. I did report the problem because normally when you submit answers that are equivalent, it will accept them. And for some reason, this one didn't accept it, although it is equivalent to what they did accept. Um, so I did report it as a problem. They may have fixed it before you got to it. They may still be working on it. Um, it just depends on them. But I would definitely, definitely um, keep an alert and an eye on the problems that where you have a square root of a binomial on top and then just the U at the bottom you might have to manipulate it to be able to get um, my math lab to accept it, okay? You're not wrong, it's just they want you to manipulate it a little bit. And then directions don't say anything about manipulating that. And me, for example, on the test, I mean, I would have taken this, this is probably what you would have seen in the, in the um, choices, not that one, okay? So, that is what it is. I just wanted to make you aware of it because when I did the problem set, I found myself upon this situation. So now you know, you even have an example on how to manipulate that one. But that is the end of 8.2. And so I'm going to stop.